you work with children with childhood apraxia speech or if you have a child with childhood apraxia speech, today's episode is for you. We are going to dive into childhood apraxia speech and how childhood apraxia speech is not something that simply occurs in the mouth. We are going to dive into how we need to take a holistic approach to treating this multifaceted condition that childhood apraxia speech is. I can't wait to share with you the very latest research, and this is going to inform what you do on Monday morning when you work with children with childhood apraxia speech. I'm going to pose three questions for you to consider to improve your practice. So let's dive into the latest research and let's talk about how we can bridge this into your practice on Monday morning. The researcher of this article is someone I am really loving at this time. Okay, her name is Karen Shinoski. And Karen Shinoski has a background in neuroscience and she just started in a, a few years ago in researching autism and speech development. And what she's looking at is the motor speech impairment in autism. So when I say motor speech disorder, I'm talking about the reason these children are not developing speech naturally is because there's a neurological or physiological reason. And what I like about Karen Shinovsky's work is she's looking at the multiple reasons for them not developing speech. A lot of researchers or, or clinicians tend to come up with this one theory of why children with autism don't develop speech. Well, children with autism don't develop speech because of a lack of joint attention. Uh, children with autism don't develop speech because of a lack of theory of mind. There is this simple fill in the blank here. And autism is not that simple. It's multifaceted. And the children with autism are not developing speech for multiple neurological and physiological reasons. So there's auditory perception issues. That's one reason of many they're not developing speech. There's motor coordination issues. That's one reason of many they're not developing speech. There's inconsistency issues, motor of complex motor movements. That's one reason of many that they're not developing speech. There's motor delays. That's one reason of many they're not developing speech. There's proprioception difficulties. That's one reason of many that they're not developing speech and gathering sensory perception issues and knowing where the body is in space. So I just listed five neurological reasons for children with autism to not develop speech. And for the last 30 years, we have not improved our outcomes when it comes to children with autism speech development. So when we look at 30 years ago, 25% to 30% of the children didn't develop fluent speech as adults. And today that statistic's the same. We're not improving that number. So it's time to DSD, do something differently. And when I wrote this book, my speech sound disorders, there's a whole chapter developed to uh, childhood apraxia of speech and autism. And I said, when it comes to autism, it's the first line in the chapter. It says, my number one piece of advice is treat the motor speech disorder, or you're not going anywhere. So if we want to help these children develop speech, we have to stop pretending that the speech is simply going to naturally develop. All we need to do is play with the child and then we're going to have joint detention and then they'll start talking with us. It's not that simple. There are neurological, there are physiological differences that we have to overcome in order to help these children develop speech. So the issue here is, first of all, we don't recognize that there's a motor speech disorder until very recently in our field in ASHA. And I think this author, Karen Shinovsky, is being a big part of that in her research. So Karen Shinovsky, in this research I'm going to cover today, is the lead author. And she is churning 
research out right now on the motor speech disorder in autism. And she's looking at it from a wide angle lens, like I was telling you, in which it's not just about motor coordination. It's also about auditory perception. And it's also about inconsistency. And it's also about a motor delay. delay. So she's looking at all of these areas and that's refreshing to see as a researcher to say, this is multifaceted. And if we don't step back and see all of the obstacles that we have to address in order for speech development to develop, we're not going anywhere. So Karen Shinovsky is perhaps my favorite researcher at this time when it comes to autism speech development. So she came out of Helen Tagger Flushberg's lab, which was granted over a million dollars to focus on this hard topic of developing speech for children with autism. Now, Shinovsky, so keep your eyes on her. I've seen her speak in person, and I had the great pleasure of talking to her after her speech. And I just felt like, oh, this is a kindred spirit. This is someone else that is as passionate, as an obsessed as I am with giving these children a voice. This is someone else that isn't sleeping at night because she's hitting the drawing board again and again and again and again because she has a vision like I do of not talking for the children with autism, but empowering the children with autism to be at the table and to talk with us. So I feel this passion in this researcher, Karen Shinovsky, and I think that we're going to see great things come out of her. And I think that she is going to have, let's just say, larger in studies in the future. She's going to have a greater impact. She is going to improve outcomes as a result of her research in what we're doing in autism intervention. So keep your eyes open for this researcher, Kieran Shinovsky. We're going to see good things out of her, and she's already doing some good work early on in her career. So let's look at her research here. She looked at 375 children, and these are our children. They're ages two to six years of age, the average age being four and a half. She looked at their medical records. Now, before I dive into these numbers, I'm going to be honest. This is probably skewed to children that have more comorbidities because this is from the Mayo Clinic, which is located in a hospital. So children that go to a hospital to receive therapy are probably also receiving occupational or physical therapy as well. There's probably more likely to be skewed to have a medical condition underlying it than you would see in a public school setting. So you always have to caveat emptor when it comes to research. And that's something to keep in mind. These numbers may be more skewed toward a comorbidity being that these are numbers from a hospital setting. Now let's look at what we have here. What she found, is she looked at 375 of our kiddos. If you listen to my, my podcast, I assume you work with ages two to six years. So these are our kids. And she found that out of these 375 children with childhood apraxia speech, only one of these children just had childhood of apraxia speech. Now that's something to think about because how often do you treat children with childhood apraxia of speech and your goals are all childhood apraxia of speech goals and your, your evaluation is a childhood apraxia of speech evaluation and your treatment is a childhood apraxia of speech treatment and only one of the 375 just had childhood apraxia of speech. So are you treating childhood apraxia of speech in a multifaceted manner to reflect the multifaceted condition that it is? So let's see what she found. So of those file reviews, her and her colleagues found that over 95% of these children also had an expressive language delay. But it doesn't end there. Over 78%, this is a huge number, had a comorbid intellectual disability. We don't typically like to evaluate cognition. I'm not sure about the hospital setting, so much so in the schools before the age of seven. But that's a high number. 
for these children that are average age of four and a half for over 78% to have an intellectual disability as well. Over 72% had a language comprehension delay. So now we're in receptive language and expressive language and we're throwing in an intellectual disability. So we're seeing childhood apraxia of speech and the comorbidities that this is more than just occurring in the mouth. This is multifaceted. And remember only one child only had childhood apraxia of speech. What else did she find? Over 37% had apraxia in the oral motor areas with their mouth movement, apraxia in their visual ocular motor movements with their eyes, or apraxia with their limbs. So what we're finding is childhood apraxia of speech is multifaceted. However, what I want you to consider is how many times have you treated childhood apraxia of speech as if it is just a speech impairment. And in doing so, you're missing out on so much because communication is speech and it's language and it's body movements. It doesn't occur just in the mouth. 80% of communication occurs outside of the mouth. We need to remember that, but also we have a language issue here. So when we're treating childhood apraxia of speech, we have to remember we're not speech pathologists, we're speech language pathologists. So looking at these numbers, what she found is when you do have the intellectual disability and the language comprehension issue and the limb apraxia, when you do have these more pervasive impairments, you are more likely to have severe childhood apraxia of speech. So what do we do with this information? What it tells us is we need to take a step back and look at our practice from a wide angle lens. And we need to see if we're taking a multifaceted approach to intervention or if we're pretending that this is just speech. What are questions we can ask? Number one, we can ask, how can I improve the language expression? We know that over 95% had language as well as speech issues. So think about your treatment target. Your treatment target can do both. I've shown this in my research, it's in my book, and our research is that if you have your speech targets those complex clusters embedded in a paragraph format using tier two vocabulary, you're gonna improve not only the speech, you're also gonna improve the language. Let's look at the second question. Can I improve language comprehension? Now, what we know from our research today is we are not gonna improve language comprehension with these simple one-step tasks that James Law and his Cochrane Review showed us in 2001. We're not gonna do it with the WH bingo. We're not gonna do it with the two-step commands, tap your head, clap your hands, three-step commands, tap your head, clap your hands, stomp your feet. But what Trina Spencer and Douglas Peterson are showing us is that we can improve language comprehension when we focus on narratives. I am going to be focusing on language comprehension on speechpathology.com in the narrative intervention piece. So make sure to check that out. So we can improve language comprehension by using narratives. Can we incorporate narratives into our childhood apraxia of speech? Yes. Yes, we can. So I would do a one day training, uh, and I did this two years ago. I had to stop for the Bureau of Education and Research and I, cause it was four school days a year, I would have to take off and I couldn't take that much work off, unfortunately, cause I loved doing it. And it was on the evaluation and treatment of childhood apraxia of speech. I was looking at was of course the language expression. I was looking at the language comprehension through storytelling. The last question I was gonna ask is, how can I improve the movement, the nonverbal communication? 
the 80% of how we communicate. And that's where I'm going to go to task-oriented movement activities, which anyone can provide, which the research has shown to be most effective, which is you're not touching that child, but you are challenging that child through the arrangement of the environment and through meaningful activities. So I want you to think about those three questions and I'll repeat them back to you. And I want you to think about your practice. If you're treating children with childhood apraxia of speech, one, how are you improving language expression? Two, how are you improving language comprehension? And three, how are you improving nonverbal communication? Take those three questions. And when you're treating children with childhood apraxia of speech, look at your evaluation. Are you looking at those areas? Look at your intervention and your goals. Are they addressing these areas? Because childhood apraxia of speech, as this research clearly illustrates, is not just speech. And it shouldn't be treated as simply a speech motor disorder in which all we focus on is on the speech because it's so much more than that. It's so much more pervasive. We need to treat the child. So the question I pose to you today is, is your treatment holistic enough in childhood apraxia of speech? And if it isn't, I challenge you to DSD. I want you to do something different. Do one thing different. How am I going to change it so that I'm treating the speech and language expression? How am I going to change it so I'm treating speech and language comprehension? How am I going to change it so I'm improving speech and movement? D S D. Because what we're talking about here are children whose plasticity is at its highest level right now. And you are changing the next hundred years of their life, what you do today. No pressure, but yet there is pressure. Yes, this is high stakes. And I appreciate you so much for being here today and for rolling up your sleeves and making the world a better place, one child at a time. You are always going to be first. I hope to see you Thursday at 12 noon Eastern Time Live on speechpathology.com. We are diving in to the final episode. And in that episode, we are going to look at empowering children to tell a story. Because these children with childhood apraxia of speech, they have stories to tell. These are children with language delays. And just based on the fact that they have language delays, this means they're much more likely to be victims. This means they're much more likely to suffer from anxiety. They're much more likely to suffer from depression. They're much more likely to have academic failures. They're much more likely to have social challenges. These children have stories to tell. What we want to do is we want to empower them and give them a voice so that they can advocate for themselves. Thank you so much for being here. Make sure to join me on speechpathology.com. And if you haven't yet, make sure to check out my book, Speech Sound Disorders. There's a reason why it's called a comprehensive approach to evaluation and treatment. It's not about treating a mouth. It's about treating a child. It's about changing lives. See you next week. Bye-bye.